All right. Welcome, everybody. It's so good to see so many familiar faces. Um, just introducing everyone uh, on, on our end. We've got Jane who uh, from, from Rad Reads, who just runs the Titus Titus uh, ship. Uh, and we've got our special guest, uh, Mr. Dickie Bush. And we're going to we'll welcome Dickie. Hello, Jane. Good to see you. How's it going? Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Um, we are, uh, as we get um, people trickling in, why don't we, I don't know, what's a, what's a good icebreaker question to, uh, to, to, to get to, to ask in our chat today? Hmm. Let's How say, about, I don't know, what do you got? I, I'm going to say, this, uh, this is one that I've been using often, but it, I, I, I dig it. What about lockdown life are you trying to retain? Um, and I don't know, I know we've got a global audience, but um, what, what, are you try, what are you trying to retain about lockdown life, Dickie? I am trying to retain taking an hour long walk in the middle of the day, 1 p.m. like clockwork. I am in the sun, just trying to soak in as much as I can. And I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to do it. I'm in a in shiny Tampa, Florida right now. So uh, more okay. as much sunshine as I can get, you know, before I might not be able to. Awesome. Or, awesome. For me, I'm going to say, um, dinner, dinner, dinner with the girls, the, the family dinners, um, have just been easier because so many less, less logistics. And, and my, my six-year-old, when we all, when we all started eating dinner together, she would go, we having a family day. And, and she still says that every time the four of us are together. So, so it's a, it's just a wonderful, uh, little reminder. So, um, awesome. Well, it's two past the hour and, uh, I can't wait to read everyone's, um, everyone's, um, responses after. So Jane, let's, uh, let's fire up our first poll. Dickie, we got a poll going. Uh-oh, here we go. Yeah. So let's, um, just answer question one for now. We're, we're still working on uh, getting our Zoom polls going. Awesome. What drew you to this interview? All right. It's like a uh, horse racing. I always get so excited when, all right, everyone, we'll just answer all of them. We, we're, we're learning our polls as we go along. All right, building an audience, um, getting better at Twitter. Looks like building an audience. A um, little less on online courses, not too many lurkers. And what do you find most challenging about building an audience? We got 42% uh, saying being consistent. Um, and this, uh, 30, 30% 30 being judged. So, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna come back to, we're gonna come back to these, uh, these questions. I love those so, answers. Thanks. Thanks to everyone for, uh, for, for filling these out. So, all right, we are going to get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kay He. I'm the creator of Rad Reads, the email newsletter and the blog. And I teach the online course, um, Supercharge Your Productivity. Like I said, I'm joined um, by my colleague, Jane, uh, and by our special guest, uh, Dickie Bush. Good to have you, Dickie. Oh, this is, this is a true uh, full circle moment. So I'm excited <laughs> to, to dive into all that today. Amazing. So I'm going to start with a story. And this was um, probably January 8th, 2020. And we're at a bar in New York City. Yeah, remember those things? A really crowded bar with yelling in each other's ears, like, I can't hear you. Can you speak louder? Um, and it's a Rad Reads happy hour. And there's about 100, 80 or so people. And um, Dickie and I had DM'd a little bit around, around then. And I knew he, had, he is in financial services like, like, like me. And at the end of the event, he pulls me aside and he said, Hey, I just got this newsletter starting that I'm starting. And do you have any advice for me? And to be honest, nothing against it. I get that question so many times from so many different people and I never hear from the person again. And so I gave my standard answer, which I guess is not my standard answer. I said, just write for 52 weeks and see what happens. Normally I say 26. So maybe 
the, uh, the, the drinks were talking uh, that night, or I wanted to give Dickie an extra challenge. So I said that, and, and, I was, and I said, maybe, you know, I wonder when I'll see Dickie again. I know we've DM'd and so on. Fast forward now, it's a year and change later. And seriously, I am here to learn. I think I'm always learning, but I'm here to learn from Dickie because in that year, he has gone on while having a full-time job, he has gone on to uh, grow his audience on Twitter to, I think, 23,000 people, last I checked. For the record, it's taken me six years to get to 16 to get to 15,000, six years. Um, and on top of that, he uh, has grown, he has created a community and an online course called Ship 30 for 30, uh, which has, you know, very vibrant community paying students, people super excited. And then this little extra thing, he has an emoji that's like, he owns an emoji. And if you, again, if you're in these Twitter circles, you've seen that ship emoji. I can't go a day on Twitter without seeing the ship emoji. And that is um, Dickie's course, Ship 30 for 30. So again, six-year creator, I got a ton to learn here. So I'm thrilled to have Dickie here. And so Dickie, just tell us, tell us a, a, a little bit about yourself because you happen to have a day job as a portfolio manager. Yeah, so first like you said, with that story, it's so cool to be here. I guess it's a little over a year now, but with how fast it's all gone, it's hard to, to look back on that. But your advice was the advice I still give every single person now when I first start talking to them about sharing anything online. It's put your head down and do it for 52 weeks and watch it change your life. I think what you said, I remember so specifically, it wasn't even just see what happens. It was watch it change your life. And I took that to heart and I've learned a, a lot of lessons along the way of what to do, what not to do, how to handle it all. And it was, so first of all, thank you for that because that was, it was, I was on edition three of my newsletter, maybe edition wow. two. And wow. it was, I, I had signed up seven of my friends against their will and basically said, Hey, I'm going to put this out every week. And read it or not. And I think the open rate was probably 50% on that first week. So it's all, <laughs> which, which, which is funny, but no, it's been a, uh, a really fun time growing and building on, on Twitter and online while having a, a full-time job, because what I do kind of online and what I do full-time, they're very orthogonal, different ways of thinking, different ways of doing things. And so uh, it's been fun to just kind of grow and explore. So, so zoom us out. You're, you've got this job that's probably pretty demanding. You were watching markets, macro trading, and all that. Where, where did the, the urge or the, the inkling to, to do anything online, how did that arise? I think it was a forcing function for me to start to clarify some of the things I was learning. So I was when, when you live in New York, you have a lot of commute time, uh, third, 25 minute walk here and there, walking to lunch, walking to and from. And I had a pair, an air, pair of AirPods and was just absolutely mowing through podcasts and audiobooks and all this stuff. But as I was learning them, they would find their way into the back of a, a Notion notebook and sit there for a month or two months and nothing would happen. And I was already kind of writing a weekly summary to myself of, here are the things I learned or listened to that week to try to better understand them. And as I came into 2020, I said, okay, I, I had immersed myself in kind of the online writing space and just recognized the leverage of it and realized there was a ton of things that I was already doing that if I just put them out there online, it's free upside. And so that was the, the newsletter was, and it's a, it's a forcing function for a little bit of clear thinking where now, instead of just writing a summary to myself, I'm running it to people who are reading, I'm going to learn it better. And I said, look, if, if nothing happens over the next year, great. I was going to do this anyway. And I probably learned a little bit more from it. So it was pure upside. And like we saw, the, the upside was real. Wow. So this word leverage, right? It, as you know, my audience will know, it's one that I think about often. Because to me, you see that surfboard in the back. To me, leverage is the business keeps running while I'm on that board. Uh, and I try to, you know, all of my activities try to be uh, centered around that bigger purpose. 
but you were you at that moment you were you were just you were taking not just you were taking notes for yourself right doing what presumably 52 people on this call do they listen to podcasts they read blog posts just like i found this idea interesting this quote was good what what how did you see the leverage in that like where did you see the leverage in that i think it was recognizing everyone that I was reading and learning from was really just doing the same thing. They were out there learning something for no other reason than to learn it themselves, but they were sharing their learnings. Yeah. And I say this example all the time. Tim Ferriss would have his podcast if no one listened because every single conversation he has is the exact one that he wants. And the byproduct of that is a tremendous conversation. Right. So when you when you're aligned with what you're sharing for no other reason, for a selfish reason, the the results tend to trend in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's it, it's effectively like a public notebook, so to speak. And, and I, it's something that I can I can relate to where I still feel this way about rad reads. I'm about to hit send on my 300th. It's like I was going to read these five articles anyway. I wanted to think about them anyway. And now I've got this group, you know, of 30,000 people that are going to be a little bit disappointed if I not, if I don't hit, hit the send button. Um, and so, so you're, you're taking these notes and you write, you start writing this newsletter. Tell us about what, what was hard about that kind of those early days. The, the feeling that you know the leverage is coming, but it's not here yet. Mm -hmm. And you're writing something to a hundred people and it takes you three hours and you're saying, is this worth it? Is this worth it? And you do that for 12 weeks in a row. And, and I'll, I'll give you some numbers. Mm -hmm. I had 175 email subscribers in, I guess it was the end of August, right? Okay. So it took me eight months to get to 175. Now, wow. I from wasn't our a January conversation. Where from our January three. and. Yeah. And, and I really liked that you had that poll at the beginning because what held me back during that time was the fear of being judged for writing a newsletter, right? Mm -hmm. I was very passively like, oh, share it if you're interested. But mm -hmm. the, the mental shift of getting over the fact that you're doing it and that, and look, we can dig into a ton of the, the, the mindset side of, of sharing mm -hmm. ideas online because it's a, it's a problem that everyone faces, but it's a zero to one moment the second you, you kind of get over it. And the, the hardest part was, were those weeks where it's Sunday, I haven't written it yet. And that mm. idea creeps in your head of like, dude, you're really going to sit down for three hours, write this thing. And people are going to scroll through it in their mm. inbox yeah. time and time again. Mm -hmm. And so those were the, the hardest struggles for sure. And so you're going, what's getting you over that hump, right? You're, you're, you're kind of, you're that, you've turned into that guy with a mm -hmm. sub stack, right? It's almost like the, the latest meme, right? You know, two years ago was podcasts, you know, seven years ago was 10 years ago was blogs. Um, you're that guy. It's not coming naturally to you and you're not seeing the results. What gets you yeah. over the hump? I mean, eight months think, is a long time, 30, yeah. 35 weeks. I think it was the, so I definitely, I grew from that in recognizing that it was not going to be that sustainable for much longer, but getting to 35 weeks goes back to the very beginning where time and time again, I said, this is a beneficial exercise for me, whether or not people read it. Mm -hmm. And so it was, yeah, the, I'm not seeing the pure upside that I was really hoping for, but at the end of the day, I still should be doing this. Mm -hmm. And luckily I, I didn't, I didn't stop. And that was kind of the, that's, it's slowly, 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 and then all happens at once. Yeah. Wow. And so, so yeah, so you're, you're in month eight. I think you said 175 subscribers mm -hmm. Your jobs. I mean, we're in the middle of like the, the depths of COVID right at, at that point. Um, sounds like you had your first watershed moment or first spike. I could tell people I, the first spike for me was Bloomberg wrote an article about me. So my first spike that you know, I had about a thousand subscribers and I think I gained 3000 in, in one weekend was, mm -hmm. uh, because, but it was a front page Bloomberg article. Um, so that was my first spike. Um, what was your, 
first thing that was like whoosh like when the hockey stick started to move yeah it, it was it's so I, at the end of august i or really beginning of august i said i'm going to stop publishing a weekly blog post so while i was running a newsletter i was writing on my own personal website also expecting people to come and read and, <laughs> and send me tons of attention every time i had published so same idea and i said okay i i've been committed to this weekly thing and it's not really my feedback loops were super loose. I had kind of an idea of what I wanted to write about, things I wanted to share. But on this weekly cadence of a blog post, it just wasn't it wasn't a tight enough feedback loop. So I said, OK, I'm going to go where there are eyeballs. I'm going to start sharing on Twitter. I'm going to write four or five threads a week on all this stuff and just put more content out there. Just just straight up. So I said, I'm going to write 35 tweets every week, schedule them out get these ideas that felt too short for blog posts, but I just needed to explore. I needed more data points, both from the market and from myself. Mm -hmm. And so that was my cadence for August. And then a hundred and so tweets later, I wrote a thread on Bology Srinivasan um, from- Which one, on what, I'm sorry? On Bology Srinivasan. He's oh, uh, yeah. just like a philosopher. Oh, you yeah, know, yeah. modern He's day philosopher, tech, former yeah. C- Andreessen, partner. former CTO of Coinbase. Coinbase. Yeah. So yeah. I heard him on a podcast and was like, I need to just immerse myself in this dude's worldview and listen to five or six of them and put together a thread on all, like everything I learned from him. And Naval picked it up. And I went from, I, I tweeted it out at like eight o'clock at night, threw my newsletter at the bottom and went to bed at like 500 Twitter followers. And which I had kind of gained from the previous threads, woke up with 1300. I dropped my newsletter at the bottom and went from 300 to 700 overnight. So I like to say it took me 40 weeks to get to 300 and 12 hours to double from there. While you were sleeping, right? Leverage, baby. That was exactly right. And that was like a whoa moment that you don't have to generate these audiences and this attention yourself. There are ways to leverage other people who... If you're adding value and doing a good job there, that was kind of the, okay, I don't have to create this demand. It's there. Got let's it. find it. Wow. Okay. So that's a lot to process there. And this is where our, our paths start to diver, our creator paths start to diverge. So you had a blog that was unsuccessful, like well, not unsuccessful, but people weren't clicking on it. Mm-hmm. And so you basically said, whatever I was going to write on the blog, I'm going to write as threaded tweets. Mm-hmm. So that's that ins- that's insight number one, basically. And and in your words, go where the eyeballs are. Yeah. Which, by the way, I, I'll tell uh, a little secret, uh, open secret from my blog. My blog gets about eighty thousand uniques a month, which sounds awesome. But uh, seventy eight thousand of them come from two pages on Notion. So my portfolio of ideas gets zero exposure other than my newsletter. So I'm sitting here listening to you being saying, wow, like those blog posts that I write could get way more attention if I went to where the eyeballs are, which is Twitter. I mean, and again, you didn't even have, you had three, 500 followers. I mean, I'm at 15,000, but it's, it's a shift because you, it's making me realize. And I, I feel like I know this, you know, game quite well. I'm like, holy crap, I'm writing, still writing into a void, which is being propped up by two pages on out of 300 posts and an email newsletter where I say, read this thing that I wrote. Mm-hmm. So it's actually, it, you're, you're, you're pointing out a lot of really, um, really, really insightful things. I will say personally, I am like, I'm scared of, tw- I'm scared of posting my blogs on Twitter for that same uh, reason that, uh, the number two reason in our poll is fear of being, there's something about Twitter because you can like, people can react quite quickly mm, mm. that I was just like, eh, I don't want to see all that noise. And it's like, okay, well, here's the blog and no one's going to read it mm. <laughs> or just the people you send it to. So, um, so well, there, there, there well, wasn't a question there, but how do you react to, to So, just- so let me, let me put you into the Twitter algorithm and kind of my realization. So from a first principles, how do people see your tweets? They either follow you, someone retweets one of your tweets or someone likes one of your tweets. 
-hmm. Now, every single time that happens, it shows up on more timelines and there's network effects to it. Mm -hmm. And it's in Twitter's best interest to share the best content. So Twitter is the ultimate idea refinery where everything you put out there, if it resonates, it's going to get a lot of good attention because people are liking it, people are sharing it. Mm -hmm. But since it's a feed, if it gets no attention and it wasn't that good, it just, it just goes away. Mm -hmm. No one finds it. And uh, I mean, if you look at my Twitter analytics, I have 20 something thousand followers. My great tweets get 300, 400,000 impressions because people with big accounts like them, retweet them and there's a network effect. But mm. still to this day, if I put something out that's like a dud, it gets three or 4,000 and kind of just mm -hmm. falls off and no one sees it again, yeah. right? So the, the idea of using Twitter both for small bets and saying, I'm going to share prolifically and without fear mm. is very difficult because this goes back to the mindset part of you assume that everyone is looking at your profile mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. When you, you were the last thing on most people's minds and that, that's, that's the big. Shift. Got it. Got it. So, okay. So you're in this, so you have this discovery, there's the tweet storms and then you're, you're just put cascading. You said 35, you're scheduling 35 tweets a week. So that's like mm -hmm. five a day, right? How, mm -hmm. how many, um, how long would it take you to schedule 35 tweets? About an hour and a half on every Sunday. Hour. So it took, it, it, it took, it went from uh, like, when you have this creative outlet, everything that this is the whole consumer to creator shift. Once you have a, a medium to start to share ideas, it becomes a lot easier to find ideas mm -hmm. because every little thing I, I see another tweet, Ooh, that's an idea for a tweet later. Boom, save that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so I, I'm, I'm working from a state of abundance, just going about my daily life. Mm -hmm. And, but in the beginning, yeah, it took a little bit longer, but then towards the end, it's now I sit down and I knock out, I still do it. Yeah. I knock out 35 in 30 minutes. And now I have wow. so many ideas too, that I can resurface and bring them all back. So that uh, would, would yeah. you say to, to our listeners, uh, that's something I might uh, I think I need to, to add into my workflow, but to our people listening who, you know, have 50 followers, a hundred followers, a couple hundred followers, would that be the highest leverage thing that they can do right now? And I, I think it, I'd even go more than 35. Okay. I'd go 50 in the very beginning because you, so here's the math of it. If you go from 1000 to 10,000 followers, 90% of your audience has not seen a single thing that you've written on Twitter, at least, right? because they're only seeing your newest stuff. So you have to get comfortable. Everyone wants to find their niche, but no one wants to repeat themselves a thousand times, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's getting comfortable sharing these same ideas in subtly different ways. And so this whole data-driven process of I'm going to share a ton of ideas, find the ones that resonate, keep iterating, 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 and then just find a way to take those three or four and share them in a hundred different ways where it doesn't look like I'm repeating myself, but I really am. Mm, fascinating. Fascinating. And I will, I will say that I have, so, so in, in marketing and copywriting, there's a concept that you might, that the audience might not be familiar with called swipe files, which is if you see something good, a good headline, a good blog post, a good framing, a good tweet, you basically save it and copy it or emulate it. And, uh, there, if, in my swipe, in my Twitter swipe file, there's a lot of your tweets. So I'm like, ooh, he got, he, he got this right. So, um, so I want to cover two more, two more topics and then open it. There's so many incredible questions. There's the challenge for the audit. I gave you the 52 week challenge and look where it got you. So the challenge to the 54 of you here is 35 to 50 tweets a week um, scheduled, which means you do it all in one sitting. Um, and, um, and yeah, you don't need, you can start from ground zero and you can kind of rehash other, other people's ideas. So consider that a challenge issued from, from, from Dickie, uh, and ind indirectly from myself. But one thing that I have really loved watching your trajectory, uh, and learning from you is that like me, you have a fondness for copywriting. And I want you to first describe copywriting like what is copywriting explain that to to 
to our to our audience uh, first. To me, copywriting is communicating a problem and a solution in the written word, and it's persuasion of the written word, basically. Mm -hmm. And you realize that everything in this world is sales, and so copywriting is simply a skill of communicating your value better than better than your competitor or better than others. Got it. And I encourage you all to go into Dickie's feed and, and just scroll and you'll see, you'll read, you, you, you'll read a tweet and you'll be like, he's in my head. And he, you've never met him. We're in, I mean, by virtue of you being here, we're in overlapping idea circles. Um, but I would add, I would add the, on the copywriting point, because I do think copywriting is like, you know, 1K, 10K work. It's a superpower that I think people who hang out in uh, rarefied, uh, into, you know, Dickie went to Princeton, I went to Yale. Uh, they're kind of like, ah, that's like, that's the direct mail group, right? No, 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 no. Copywriting is a secret weapon because like Dickie said, everything is a sale. Your Tinder bio, not that I would know because I've been with my wife for 14 years, uh, is a sale, right? Why should I swipe, right? Um, your Twitter bio, uh, when you pitch an investment committee, it's a sale. Your resume is a sale. And as more and more things move online, there's more selling. And I know that might sound icky and transactional, but it's just the reality because everyone's doing it in the same idea space, in the same product space. If you're a coach and you're trying to get new clients, you need to sell so that people will hire you as a coach. And if you're not, someone else is. And so the magic moment for me uh, with copywriting was with my own course, Supercharge Your Productivity. The first two or three, I was just like the left brain. We're actually both engineers by, by training and, and finance people. So it's just like, here's a fact about my course. There's 17 modules and the, you'll learn 18 features and then there'll be 14 instructors and then there's 72 hours of videos. But what copyright... Um, copywriting teaches you is that um, it's the psychology behind why people gravitate to your idea. And a lot of it is um, they want to be better versions of themselves, right? And, and whether it's a Notion course, a Twitter account, um, a meditation app, the skill of copywriting is a skill of understanding the psychology of your customer, your audience, and then using, uh, and then using words to, um, to, to meet them there. Right. And, and it, copywriting gets a bad rap because it emerged from, you know, direct mail and this like buy this, you know, in the next 42 hours or else your head's going to explode and you'll be a worthless sack of S H I T for the rest of your life. Like, yeah, sure. That's one way of copywriting, but another way of copywriting is, is it's like the purest form of empathy. It's like, I see you. Mm. And I happen to have something that could help you, whether, and it could be a tweet or a blog post. So on that note, um, how, did you, how did you get so good at copywriting? I, I, I do still think I'm figuring it out, but the, the easiest copy to write is the one that you're basically solving your own problem and one you very personally experienced. So this brings us to ship 30 and the copywriting that I've done the most and have had the most success with is simply describing the problem that everyone early on in their writing career faces, you know, writing consistently, finding time to write. This was imposter syndrome, perfectionism. Basically our poll. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. <laughs> and so the, the zero to one shift is once you identify the problem, say there's seven reasons it's a problem. And so, or, or seven of those problems, right? People struggle to write online. Why? Here are seven reasons. Your copy simply turns those problems, positions your product as the solution, and then says what the benefits are if they unlock these, right? So just a little formula. It's like problem, your solution, benefit. And you structure that as however you want. So for the very top of our landing pages, you know, finally start writing online right? That, that plays to the point of, I've wanted to do it for a long time. Here's why I haven't. And it's the old way is trying to write alone into the void. The new way is with a community of others. And once you do that, you'll have this, right? So it's a, it to me made sense. is like a formula, be, like you said, our, our right brain on 
benefit solution and then just mix and match. So it, it's a, once you start to see it, you see it everywhere. And then it's okay. Now I know how to position myself and beyond just writing uh, yeah. conversations, everything. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I want to really point out that once you see good copy, you can't unsee it. It's everywhere. It is mm -hmm. everywhere in our world. And by the way, I strongly believe that you have to use that superpower responsibly. Like you, you mm -hmm. drive people to shitty products. That's, I think that's immoral. Uh, and, and because you have a, you know, secret weapon to do so, you should not be doing that. Um, but I'll give you an example. You could see some copy like, um, for once, get that night of, you know, go to bed with complete stillness and wake up, uh, ready to own the day. Right. Mm -hmm. That could be, that's not great copy, but you know, that's a benefit, right? Go to mm -hmm. bed with pure stillness or, or, you know, pure, um, at peace and wake up ready to own the day. That could be copy for a vitamin, a gym, <laughs> a mattress, um, or, uh, a meditation app, right. And you, you actually see that, like when you start to see good copy, you could actually remove the product mm -hmm. and see that it could be 10 different products yet still feel some kind of physical compulsion towards that. And again, I'm not saying that you should be nefarious with this because everyone People have figured this out. I mean, this is not, I'm not teaching you something new, but I think it is something new in the land of online courses, in the land of building an audience, in the land of the digital. Like it is just because you're a good writer, it does not mean you're a good copywriter. They're actually mm -hmm. two completely different skills. Uh, and I learned that the hard way. I just right. assumed that I'd be good at one because I was decent at the other. So, um, so that's, that's, um, that's on, on copywriting, but let me, so let's pivot here, uh, Vicky. So all this, well, actually, was there a second watershed moment where the dam broke again? So two really from there, the, the most recent one or second most recent one was in February. Um, Tim Ferriss shouted out something I wrote back in July in five bullet Friday. So I wrote a, a thread on my 10 favorite reflection questions and linked to a few of his questions from one of his articles. And I don't know how he found it, how he stumbled upon it, but six months later, put it in his five bullet Friday. And so I went from a couple four or 5,000 to 9,000. And then once you kind of hit that 10,000 on Twitter, it, it that like the 10 K makes it much easier. You, you don't, there's like a psychology of someone following you once you're there because they don't see it increment, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like an easier thing. Yeah. And yeah. then in at the beginning of March, I wrote, or maybe it was the beginning of April, um, a thread on just advanced Twitter tips that I thought uh, were I people would find one. useful. And that one just went nuclear. It, it got 45,000 likes and just was absurd. So that one, that one was double i i went from twelve thousand to twenty four thousand overnight right oh, so the wow. <laughs> the the doubling time but here's the thing and I, I say this all the time you have to think in doubling times not in linear growth right going from 10 to 20 to 40 to 80 or i like to say going from 10 0 to 1 1 to 10 10 to 100 100 to 1000 1000 10000 those all take the same amount of work mm -hmm. and it might seem, oh, I'm at a thousand. Now I got to get to five, like six, seven. No, that it's going to be just as difficult as because if you can solve, basically, if you see your writing or your brand or anything as like we just talked about a product, people are following you. People buy a product because they want better versions of themselves. People follow you because you're giving them something that is makes them feel like they're getting something better, right? So if you the the, the scale of the internet says if a hundred people think it. 10,000 people think, right? So it's just a scale game, right? Once you're there, you just keep sharing those ideas. Things are resonating. And then from there, you can kind of, it, it takes care of itself. Wow. And so, so then not that, you know, it's, we're still in one year time, you go on to cross another milestone. And again, I, I say this with just utmost respect, because it took me four years and change to sell anything on the internet. Again, 
for a lot of different reasons. One of them is like imposter syndrome of asking people to open their wallets for, you know, Kay who writes the newsletter. Um, how did you, how did ship, tell us what ship 30 for 30 is. You, you, you started to allude to it and, um, and how that came about, because that is the next thing people like you grow an audience and then you sell to that audience. Mm -hmm. And so ship 30 for 30 is the writing community and writing challenge that I wish I had when I started, because every single problem that we've named so far, imposter syndrome, writing consistently, picking the right tools, constraints, topics, cadence, fear, all of that is taken care of very concisely in a 30 day challenge where you write and publish every day for 30 days. And see what he just did there. He listed all your problems and offered you the solution. <laughs> and, and exactly right now, now it's ingrained in me, but the, uh, it was really a function of me solving my own problem. So it started in November. And like I said, I was frustrated with the weekly cadence. So I started writing every single day in publishing screenshot essays that are now what we call atomic essays on Twitter to that are about 250 words. And it was, I was in this realm of too long for tweets, but too short for full blog posts. So I just wanted to keep this momentum going. So I went about six or seven days and started to fall off, had no community around me. So I had 800, 900 Twitter followers. And I threw something out there and said, Hey, who'd be interested in, in joining me for a 30 day writing challenge. And boom, right there. It was like, okay, we're onto something because the, the response was, was tremendous. And people were like, Oh, wow. I faced that same exact problem. There we go. So we threw everyone in a Slack channel. It was $50 and you got your money back. If you completed the challenge and we were off and running. And during that, I was just gathering data and said, okay, what are the real problems here? What are people struggling with? And how are they overcoming them? And then after that first one, we said, okay, this is clearly a problem. I think we have a good solution to it. Now it's about getting, getting it in front of people. And so from there, I just went on kind of a content bench where every thread I wrote was pointing out the problem and positioning Ship 30 as a solution. And from there, we're four cohorts in. The next one starts May 10th. And it's been an absolute blast to get to, to put it together. Wow. So that I love, there, there's a few things that I hear in that one theme that, that keeps coming up is you use data, right? You use data from your tweets. You use data really tight. I mean, that's what's mad. And I, I see that with my newsletter. I'm like, Oh, that's weird. So many people click that article on sleep. Like I don't really think of rad reads and sleep as like tightly knit, but it was so much higher like maybe I should write a post about that, right? So, but I'm on a weekly cadence through email. You're on a on a minutes cadence through idea fragments. So, so there's there's the there's data, and then you took that a step further because then you saw you were doing customer research, right? What are the problems that my future customers have, and how are they going about to solve them? And you were observing that and then pack, you know, probably packaging and offering uh, around that. Um, what, how did you learn? Did, did you like read books or do you have a mentor? Or like, how'd you, this is a lot. It took me six years to figure this stuff out. Um, any, any secret sauce there? On, on I, I think the code? so. A, a big one was I took Jack Butcher's Build Once, Sell Twice okay. in November. And I that to that me, it was you know, he, I've talked to him a lot and become friends with him since. And he said, look, a lot of people have taken that, but it doesn't click for everyone. I don't know what it was, but it clicked for me right away. Mm -hmm. It was his whole thing is you, you share ideas, you put them in front of people, you attract an audience, you figure out their problems, and then you position yourself as a solution. And once you do that, the internet scales your ideas just because of the size. So on terms of how we have gone about just packaging it it was what it, what was so beautiful about it was i was just solving my year ago problem self and i think for anyone who is looking to build an audience something i say is your audience is the people who's had the same problem you had a year ago that you've solved so for me it was wow i just went through this really frustrating nine months of growth there's a lot of people who are about to go on that same journey i'm gonna say that you can save a lot of that time and here's how and here's how i did it Right. Mm -hmm. And that was the, no one wants to learn from, 
someone at level 10, they actually prefer to learn from level five from the level five person who's learning from level eight teaches level two, right? Okay. At any moment, there's two groups of people, those you can learn from and those you can teach. And so mm -hmm. if you can continue to learn and grow, but share and make it easier for people behind you to follow on your journey, you just have this huge flywheel of I'm growing, learning, but I'm also attracting people to what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Got it. And so learning in public is a big, is a big element, which again, if you think of content flywheels, right, the learning is the content. Do, do you think that, because I, I would, um, I would imagine that a lot of people are saying, well, I'm not, I'm not an expert at writing, or I'm not an expert at, uh, you know, this time, I just became a coach. And so like, I can't, I can't share that because I'm not credentialed or I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the 10 to use your example. What, what do you tell that person? You, you are going to regret not starting sooner. The, you, I, I, it goes back to the, my last point of there's always someone you can teach. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that person wants to learn from you as a coach who's only coached two or three people because you're more authentic. You're mm -hmm. leading the way you're helping you know, it, it's just a little bit more human. People liked learning from me from 30 because I didn't have hundreds of thousands of readers and all of this. I had more than anyone taking it, but I wasn't some hero. It was, mm -hmm. here's what I'm doing and I'm learning along with you guys, right? So it's an authentic and, and you can actually leverage that in a very powerful way of connecting with the people you're working with. Yeah, incredible. All right, last question, then we're going to open it up to Q&A. Um, I'm in the world, in our Twitter worlds, it's all about note-taking apps and, and systems and zaps and screenshots and second brains, third brains, and all that. Um, could you summarize your workflow slash tech stack in a uh, in a, in a couple minutes. Yeah, sure. I, I, I've iterated it a, a decent amount. I actually spent today trialing out Things 3, which is like total new shiny toy syndrome. But I had been using Todoist for a while and found that I, I was just too frustrated working on too many things because there's like no sh keyboard shortcuts. And so I switched to just, I use drafts for almost mm -hmm. everything of just throwing stuff in there. And then um, like I do other stuff in Rome. I used to use Notion. Look, I, I bounced around everything and mm -hmm. it's always an exercise in procrastination <laughs> and the, it, the tool, I think you do a great job of a K of saying like, pick this tool, but understand why, understand why you're doing it. So my, my daily workflow is just basic GTD principles of have a nice clean project list. And at any time, know what the next step you can take on that project is. Oh. Do not try and I, I think if you were able to plan an entire two weeks of a project, you're not moving fast enough because y things are going to break. Things should break. And if, if you were executing a two week plan with like 15 tasks here to there, you didn't experiment, you didn't try, none of things went wrong. So I'm just pure in the, I got like, I'm looking at it right now. I have like 16 projects on this list. I could tell you exactly like the next click I need to make on each one. And for me, it's, and this is actually extremely cathartic to say out loud because I've spent today like just getting dominated by the resistance of, oh, I need, I should better organize all this stuff. But no, it's a, you know what the next click is and let the action bring clarity, not, not your planning. I love that. Oh man, I love that you, you brought up because I mean, so much of my, I see a bunch of our students here, so much of my philosophy and the one I teach is it's just inspired by GTD, which is, it's pretty simple right? Uh, it's it's mm -hmm. get, get to that next click, right? Mm -hmm. Don't get lost in, in all of it. So um, I, I, uh, I, I, love, I love that. Also, I've noticed that, you know, things, Rome, drafts, it sounds like at the, now the productivity geek in me is talking is that you're optimizing for speed of this speed, speed. idea. Out of I, I, I ditch onto. Notion. Yep. I, I ditch Notion only because, it's too slow. but I'll probably go back. I'll probably go back when they fix it because the, the speed was, was yeah. really the only issue, but I yeah. think they hired an awesome engineering team where I'm bullish on them. Kind of the, I, I don't know if you've seen that like peak of enlightenment <laughs> trough of product, like 
they're like at the bottom right now yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Uh, everyone's moving away from them and then they're going to plateau to like uh, a nice solid solid app. yeah no definitely definitely and i i use i use notion all the time but i use i capture in drafts so mm-hmm. i so drafts is like the intermediate step so yeah awesome well we've got you know 15 20 minutes of q a i've learned so much i if I, I apologize in advance to, to those of you that are going to start seeing, you know, 50 tweets of mine per week. Um, but, uh, Hey, I've watched it and, 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 and it works. So with that, I'm going to, uh, we've got, I've been uh, aggregating our Jane has been aggregating the questions. Um, but, uh, I'm going to pick a few from, from these and then we'll take it going. Okay. So, so uh, Tashin asks, any suggestions on identifying people's problems? How do you go about doing that? Ask, ask, seriously, just start sharing ideas. The, what you'll find is there's a large, large over, overlapping psychograph of people with similar problems who are attracted to ideas on productivity, writing, whatever it is, there's kind of this broad, you know, I like to say the, or something we say in ship 30 is the, the larger the, the question, the larger the audience, right? So everyone wants to know how to make more money, how to be more productive, how to be happier. So you share ideas on that. You're going to attract a kind of a broad, not very dense audience. If you say, I'm going to make notion for project managers working at SaaS startups, that's a very specific problem. And so you just strike that balance of who am I going for here? Who, what do I want to solve? And it's usually a top down to more specific as you go. Yeah. I would add um, a few other things is you could, some of the things I do is um, I subscribe to like 50 to 70 newsletters. And so I just, I don't read them, but I kind of skim because headlines usually, a good headline usually addresses a pro, um, a problem, right? This post that went viral from Adam Grant, there's something, there's something to describe what we're all feeling right now. It's called languishing, right? Mm -hmm. So clearly languishing is a big enough problem that A, Adam Grant will write about, B, it will make the Sunday Times. So there's something there. And again, Dickie might refer to languishing in a different set of words that I might refer to it. So, you know, reading, like going on Reddit, like the threads that your customers or audience follow, usually will have their problems. Another one, look at the best sell, look at the books that, that your audience reads, right? If people read essentialism, they have problems saying no, right? If people read deep work, they have problems focusing, right? That's what good authors do exactly these, the, what, what Dickie said. They research their audience, they understand the, pro, the, the problems they have, and they offer them a solution. The solution to your lack of focus is deep work. God. And Funny I, how that I, works. I think it's super important to point out those two books are extremely bottoms up audience first books where people, they shared a ton of ideas on a ton of different things and said, that is the pain point that a lot of people feel. I'm going to books these days, the market should be screwed. And this is me going on a tangent, but like the amount of data that you can gather from just sharing ideas in tweet form and small blogs and things like that the market should scream at you to make a book before, before you do it. And that's why those books were so successful. Yeah. James Clare will, he'll say the same thing about habits. Mm-hmm. He wrote about a wide variety of topics for eight years and then habits hit and he just double, triple, quadrupled. Morgan Housel, yeah. uh, Mark Manson, all the, the most popular authors recently. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, next question. Um, let's see. I'd love to learn about the process Dickie went from his first course cohort, which was testing and see if people would pay for it to what it is now with a course that's structured. It's just been an iterative. So we're four cohorts, cohorts in each one has just been a little bit more structured, a little bit. We find out a little bit more of what works and now we're solving problems of people who are taking the course, right? So it's, I'm already know that, the, it speaks to a certain number of people and don't have to really rewrite almost anything on that front now. But now it's, okay, for people who take Ship 30, 
How do we make it a better experience within them? How do we talk to people that are actually in it and make that even better? And so it's this, once you have people flowing into something, you know that the front end is working. Now you improve the product itself. And then, so this all goes back to kind of the feedback loops and the data. We're a ton of surveys, asking a ton of questions and just continuing to solve problems. And I, I just doubled out. We spend so much time with we, we one-on-one calls with our students. Just what worked? What did it work? What could we do better? What, what were you thinking the moment you hit buy? Like we ask these questions. I see some people in this chat that we've directly asked these questions to over video. Um, so, so just do the, do the research. And, and by the way, customers, customers love, if they loved your product, they, p- people in general like giving feedback on, on things, if it was good, if it was bad. Um, and so it just takes, it takes a lot of, a lot of time, but that the answers, the answers are there. You just have to go ask the question or, or go, um, go show up. Uh, Dickie, I got, I have one, one more question that didn't come from the chat. We didn't talk about how you got an emoji tied Mm. to your name. So the ship, you've all seen the ship. Um, how'd that, how'd that come about? It was just, we needed a way to to let everyone know on Twitter that you were taking part in the, uh, in ship 30 for 30. And so now I put it in mind and said, look, if you want to jump in and then everyone did it. And now it's a kind of a staple of if you're in ship 30, if you're an alum, it's just a, it's, it's a community. And I think it's an important branding thing for anyone building a community. If you can try to lock one down, do it because it's just a little like dopamine signal kind of thing that if everyone's doing it too, it just creates a fun vibe with the community. That's so cool. And I mean, I feel like I know the internet pretty well and I don't, I can't really think of other, I know the, there was a Justin Khan. He tried to grab the whale or the dolphin emoji that mm. didn't really work out, but I can't really, I'm, I'm sure there are probably um, some, uh, different uh, ce- celebrities and, and, and pop stars. Uh, all right. Let's see. Um, Bonnie asks, would Dickie consider himself a, a salesman first? Would he consider that one of his strong talents? No, not at all. I, I still, I, I wouldn't consider myself a, a, a good salesman in anything. I think I've learned how to do a very specific kind with, with copywriting, but I, I'm still uncomfortable in real life negotiation and all that. So no, by no means uh, has it come natural to me. But you did in a very left brain way, you broke down like steps by mm-hmm. which you can make it feel more, uh, more natural. Right? Yeah. And maybe I'll be able to apply that in real life, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, Nat asks, curious what Dickie was sending out in his newsletters. Was it something different than what he posted on Twitter? Um, my newsletter was always been a curation newsletter and it was the overlap of what I was sharing you know, the ideas I really talked about were health, wealth, relationships, and applying different principles to them, like leverage, efficiency, momentum, those kind of things. And those, the, the psychographic of people who are interested in what I was putting out um, is, is pretty high. So the, the overlap, I mean, to this day, I only have 3,000 newsletter subscribers, but my Twitter is much bigger. I think that's a little bit of platform risk, but I'm not, I think Twitter's doubling down on creators. So I feel like it's a good horse to ride in the race, but the, uh, Overall, it's um, no, uh, the, there was a pretty big overlap. Um, Matt asks, what's your process for being as efficient as possible with content creation and distribution? Create once, I, I create once, publish five times as an yeah, example. The, it's the atomization of everything where every single thread I write starts out as one or two tweets that I get a signal on that that's important. And then I write a thread. And then from there, if it's 10 tweets long, that's 10 future standalone tweets, right? The, it's the write once, how many times can I squeeze value out of this? How many times can I take tagging each thing I tweet in just a big database of here's the idea I'm talking about. So if I want to only talk about writing or only talk about audience building or wealth, I'm able to filter that down and say, okay, how can I restructure this idea in a hundred different ways? 
Got it. Let's see. Um, so last question. Uh, actually, let's take uh, Ruben's uh, question. How do you feel? How do you deal with the feeling of being judged? And I you, guess related, you, how do you deal with Twitter bullying? I think so on the first one, you realize that you are not anywhere near as important, important as you think you are. If you're afraid to be judged online, you have a massive ego problem where you assume that everyone is thinking about you, that you are top of mind, that you are the center of the world. And it's a very refreshing thing to say. And that I actually said it all the time to when I was writing that 150 person newsletter there are, and to this day, there are zero people on planet earth who are refreshing their feeds or email or websites waiting for something that I wrote. Right. And so that's a very freeing thing that I'm no longer afraid to be judged because that implies that people are like, Oh, I can't wait to see what he writes so I can read it to this day. That's still not the case. And it's a, it's a, it's a like, Oh, that sucks. Oh wait, that's awesome. I can say almost anything I want for the most part, because people have their own problems in their own lives and you are not top of mind. Mm. Bullying or like I've been, I think Twitter bullying is if, if you are nice uh, people, I, I've, I mean, at this point, like I get a couple, there's a few people who respond to everything I say with something sarcastic. And mm -hmm. I think that that comes with the scale of audience size, but I, I mean, if, it's refreshing to me that no one, if that, that that person doesn't have anything better to do with their time than respond to something that I wrote and scheduled on a Sunday, then, you know, it is what it is. That person uh, I, is I, me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but in, in a mean way, in a mean, like if, if they have a, if they're looking forward to saying something like this was a waste of time or whatever, no, you know, feel good that you're not on that other side. Yeah. And so where, I mean, you've got this, this job, you know, do the doing important investing stuff. What's your, what's your vision for, for this online side? I mean, you, you've, I can say as a, as someone who knows this world quite well, like your, your trajectory is very, very, um, impressive and, um, what, yeah, what's, what's your vision for this all? I, I don't, I can't think that far ahead. To be honest, it's a fun thing. I'm getting to learn a million new skills that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. I'm a better writer in my full-time job. I better understand leverage in this. Will, if eventually my online side and kind of what I write about converges with what I do full-time, that'd be great. I think they're very complimentary in the long run, but right now I, I just, I enjoy both. So it's a, you know, I, we're on this call and I got to meet you because of what I've done. Right. So those are the kind of things that really all the value is here is you're meeting people, building relationships, growing and learning. And then everything that comes goes back to the very beginning. It's all free upside outside of that. Right. Yeah. It's all free upside. Once you strip out the, the, the basics of I'm going to meet people, I'm going to get smarter. I'm going to be a better thinker. And from there, it's just fun. Amazing. Well, Dickie, thank you for sharing all of this wisdom on behalf of, of, of our community. Uh, like I said, it's there's something about, and at some point, my story was like, I felt that, that being on your side where it's like, I just wrote to 36 people and this thing happened. It wasn't easy, but it's, it's, it, it's in the realm of possibility. Uh, it's, it's possible for, for anyone. I think there is, I, I, I would love to refute the misconception the, everyone with an audience, whether you're James Clear, Tim Ferriss, Dickie Bush, or Kay, you started with zero, or you started with like, your friends and your mom. Um, and so, once you once people see enough of those examples, then they're like, okay, no, you don't have to wait to have a thousand or this or that. And, and I do think, like, for me personally, creating online has led to so many incredible friendships a dream business, a way to hone my creative skills, build community. It's, I think it's just a magical, it's a magical thing. So I really, uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate you sharing that. Um, with us, Dickie, where can hey, people well, go find you? Yeah. I spend too much time on Twitter. It's at Dickie Bush. Um, if you're looking to start writing, we'd love to have you in the next ship 30 cohort signups end on Friday of this week. It's going to be the number of improvements we've made from the last one. And I see some people on the call here who already signed up as well. So 
uh, we're really, really excited for some of the, the lessons we're rolling out. And this is going to be a super special cohort. So uh, that's where you can find us at ship30for30.com, which I think is in the in the links there in the chat. Awesome. And we'll send that around too in the replay. And also for those of you who um, we just announced, we're doing a five-day bootcamp on how to do 10K work. It's a free bootcamp and that starts uh, May 18th. Um, we've got two, we, I'm going to teach three sessions. We've got two incredible special guests, Nathan Berry from ConvertKit, who scaled a 60 person company bootstrapped, um, by, not, not by himself, but without any funding. And then you, many of, you know, Marie Poulin, who's just, just incredible creator, business owner, consultant, plant lover, um, a notion guru. So join that. That's starts on the 18th. Um, it's going to be an incredible, uh, incredible bootcamp and it's totally free. So hope to see you there as well. All righty. All right. Well, take it easy. Have a great Thanks, rest everyone. of the week, everyone. Okay. This Thank has you, been James. tremendous. See yeah. you, my friend. See Have a good everyone. one. Bye. Bye. Thanks.